Hey, how's it going? Welcome to another episode of Enhancing Human Experience. I am thrilled that you tuned in today. This is going to be an awesome episode. We're talking about tuning up your health, helping you feel better, helping you have more energy, all the good things that we want so we can go out and create the things that want to come through us. I'm really excited about this episode. I hope your fall is turning out awesome. I hope you're enjoying the, the cool air if you live in the climate that has the changes like we have here in Boise. And a couple things to get out of the way before we jump into this episode. For one, I want to invite you this holiday season to visit focusandflow.co and check out the products and apparel there. You know, all of those things are designed to help not only you, but people on your list tune in to the experiences they want to have in life. When, you know, we are conscious creators. Hopefully we're conscious creators when we're tuned in to our power and we're, and we're focusing deliberately, right? When we're thinking about the things and experiences we want to bring about in our life, right? That's when we're consciously creating our life as opposed to unconsciously creating or creating by default or doing what we've always done, getting what we've always got. All the products and apparel there are designed to remind you that you have the power, in, incredible power within you to create the experiences you want to have in your business and your life, to consciously create them. So I'll be putting more information about those products and ideas for you to purchase gifts this year that are designed to help the people on your list get what they want all year round, right? We've got the Preferred Experiences shirt, Preferred Experiences mug. We've got the I Love You mug, all of the series from Keep Calm, Keep Calm and Live in the End, Keep Calm and Follow Your Bliss, Keep Calm and Follow Your Dreams. All these things are daily reminders on your desk at work, You know, when you're having your morning coffee. All these things are daily reminders that you have the ability to create the experiences you want to have in life. So like I said, I'm planning on doing a whole video with a lot of ideas, you know, making gift bundles and gift baskets and what I call like a like a mug gift basket, right? Putting awesome things in a mug, buying a mug for the loved ones or or friends and family on your Christmas list. What a great gift, right? Filled with higher consciousness things, not just the stuff that you've been buying maybe for the last 20 or 30 years because everyone else is buying it, right? These are thoughtful things. These are things that are actually going to help them feel better, help them tune in to the experiences that they want, right? So I'm really excited about that. To that point, I'm also in the process of building a new set to film episodes of Enhancing the Human Experience podcast, also to make videos. I'm moving more into video, as I've mentioned before on this podcast and also on my YouTube channel, G or excuse me, youtube.com slash Phillips. You can check out that there. I'm definitely putting a big shift in video, getting way outside of my comfort zone to do that. And so look for more of that coming down the line in the next month or so. Hopefully the set will be done by, well, I'm hoping by mid to end November and we can start pushing out videos. But again, I'm going to go over s some ideas for you to uh, give conscious gifts, right? Conscious gift giving is what it's all about. So I invite you to check out focusandflow.co before you go and buy the gifts on your Christmas list. Just check it out and see what you think. Like I say, all those are designed to help people get what they want. That's the, that's the name of the game, right? Have better experiences, feel better, create the uh, prosperity and good feelings that they want. So I'm really excited about that. All right, let me tell you about my guest today. So my guest today is David Krantz, and David is an epigenetic health coach. He reached out to me recently, and I invited him to be a guest on the podcast. You know, I'm, I'm all about getting the needle or the percentage as high as possible to eating the best foods and, and like getting a little exercise, getting the energy up, feeling as, as good as I can. Now, do I sometimes eat junk food? Absolutely. Do I sometimes have alcohol? Absolutely. But my whole philosophy is getting that needle up as high as possible and getting the percentage as high as possible so that when I do have a, whatever you want to call it, cheat day or craving, that I can satisfy that craving and then get back on the path. And so I never feel guilty about this because the rock does it, right? Whatever the rock does, I'm going to I'm going to do as well. So we talk about a little bit about that in the episode about cheat meals and kind of, you know, satisfying that craving you have on on occasion. So 
I was thrilled to have David on and dive into what epigenetics is. You know, I didn't really know what that was. I knew it had something to do with, you know, modifying our, our genetic makeup and, and again, tipping those percentages more towards feeling better, having better energy and, you know, activating certain, I guess, genes or turning them on or turning them off with our diet and, the, and our exercise and things like that. A lot of goodness in this episode. I know you're going to enjoy it. So let's jump into the episode and see what David has to say. And we'll talk about how you can get in touch with him at the end of the episode, how you can find his website and his YouTube videos. I've watched a number of his videos. They're super awesome. We'll also talk about the, the blue light blocking glasses, which I have a pair of those. And there's a lot of goodness in this episode. So let's jump in and have a conversation with David Krantz, an epigenetic health coach. David, thanks for joining me. I'm super excited to chat about epigenetics and your work. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Mark. I'm, uh, I'm really excited to chat with you as well here. Absolutely. So, you know, I think for starters, let's start with what epigenetics is. I don't think a lot of people know this. I had to kind of look it up and, well, definitely look it up and refresh my my mind about it. What, what is that? Epi, what is epigenetics? Yeah, absolutely. So epigenetics is the study of how genes change their expression over time in response to different stimuli from the environment. Um, it's also kind of the study of how uh, things get passed on intergenerationally um, genetically. And so this is a little bit different understanding of what I was taught when I was in high school biology, because science just had not really nailed this down yet. Um, when I was you know, in high school and learning kind of the basics of genetics, the idea was your genes code for proteins and those proteins make up all the different things in your body that you know, cause you to have these different traits, your hair color, eye color, um, what makes you you. And that was kind of it. And what science has really discovered in the past 20 years or so, uh, and really uh, kind of the revolution in the past 15 years, this has really become the um, kind of forefront understanding, um, is that there's another control layer to our genes. If you imagine these genes producing these proteins, you, like you can almost think of it as each one has a little bit of a uh, dimmer switch on them that can turn up or down those, uh, those proteins or change the way those proteins are made um, in response to different things. Like actually when your hair goes gray, uh, that is an epigenetic process. Uh, you you kind of lose some of the pigmentation and those genes actually get turned down. Um, another example would be, um, you know, when you're, you're a baby, you're, de you're designed to be able to uh, tolerate lactose from your mother's milk and a good portion of the population loses um, that ability to make uh, lactase to process lactose over time. And that's another epigenetic um, kind of thing that happens over time. And these epigenetic changes, they, they happen on different time scales. So some things like that are uh, kind of encoded into aging. And then some things are happening on like a 24 hour cycle uh, that actually help your body go to sleep and wake up. And um, if you, you can kind of think about it as um, you know, this complex symphony and, you know, they're almost being like a conductor that's kind of causing these, these changes to happen routinely. Mm -hmm. Um, and so epigenetics is this really broad category where, um, we've kind of discovered that almost every single health promoting or health detracting process in the body has some type of epigenetic component to it because it, it's so pervasive and then just so underlying everything. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's a pretty exciting thing to, um, it sounds like it. I mean, it sounds like it's the like the control center for for everything. Which, I mean, are the foundation of our all the things about us and that our changes in our body. Is that fair? Or? It's uh, I wouldn't say every single thing, but it's pretty close. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, most major changes are going to be are going to have some epigenetic component to them. So yeah, it's uh, okay. Pretty. It's, it's powerful. powerful. It, it's a, if it affects a lot. It sounds it like it affects a lot. And it's also kind of an empowering perspective too, because it really actually shows us yeah. that we actually can change a lot of things that we previously didn't think we could. Yeah. And that, that's what, that's what fascinates me. You know, I've, I've read and seen people having experience with say, you know, going on a plant-based vegan diet and their hair color coming back and maybe different types of skin elasticity. I mean, are you experienced, is that part of this? I mean, is that potentially 
uh, possible? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, I see it with all kinds of diets and then that's the thing that I'm, I'm super fascinated by is sometimes I see things like that, positive changes, kind of miraculous things happen from a plant-based diet. Sometimes I see it from someone who's been a vegan for 10, 15 years, switching to a high quality meat-based diet. And so sometimes it's, you know, giving the body the right nutrients and um, yeah, food is a major epigenetic modifier. So yeah. And, and that's one of the things that I'm really fascinated to dive into here because, you know, in my experience, I always go back to, you know, what are you eating and what are you thinking? Because those are our like foundational building blocks, you know, thoughts are things and they, they actually affect the way our body kind of expresses itself and things happen because of those things. And then of course, diet. So what's been your experience when you, so you've seen positive changes when, when people change a diet, um, T- talk about the difference between like you look at it, you look at it on an individual basis, it sounds like. And that's what I think a lot of people don't. They just say, well, my friend is getting awesome results with this diet. I'm going to do it. And they don't really look at themselves. And that's what I've seen a lot. But you look at an individual, you analyze the genes first, right? And then tailor a diet for yeah, that's them. Exactly is that what, what you I do? do? And I just want to uh, speak to what you're saying about, you know, both thoughts and, you know, what, what you're feeding yourself with your thoughts and, you know, physical food all makes an impact. And there's some really awesome studies uh, that show how, you know, your belief system and the way that you, uh, you know, carry yourself emotionally can impact yourself epigenetically pretty strongly. Oh, yeah. So um, like, uh, for example, like meditation, uh, regular meditation has been shown to change the expression of a, of a couple thousand different genes. Uh, and just like putting yourself in those types of wow. states is, is really powerful. Um, wow. Yeah. It's so, so, so that we have, it sounds like we have a lot more control than we think yes, we have. I, I'd say so. And, and like the, the changes, um, and they, they're, and I, this is an area that I'm really fascinated in right now. And, and there's not a ton of research yet. Um, there's actually, there's actually like maybe six or seven studies that really show this strongly, but they, they've looked at changes in people going to psychotherapy and looking at the benefits of main, of having like a positive, you know, relationship with a therapist and, and looking at epigenetic changes. And they find that people in these studies that have the best outcomes show epigenetic changes in certain areas. So it's about, you know, re repatterning the way you think about yourself and the way you relate to other people can have impacts on the way that your genes express. It's pretty fascinating. Oh, wow. Yeah. How, how, so like you said, this is, these are, this is research that's coming about. How long have we been like studying these epigenetic, like this idea, this fairly new field? Fairly new field. I mean, the, the first kind of in like, uh, hints of this came in the, in the eighties. Mm-hmm. Um, and then once we mapped the human genome in 2001, or so that's really when we started to have the actual tools to be able to look at this stuff. Okay. Um, so, I mean, we're really only about 15, 20 years into like a really good understanding of this kind of thing. Wow. Wow. So t- tell us about, you know, when you, when you coach your clients and how that process works and what kind of changes they can experience in, in when you're working with them. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, you know, I regularly and routinely see people with uh, better energy, better focus, uh, really looking at better cognitive function for people, weight loss. Uh, but it's because exactly like you said, I'm really tar- tailoring things for people's individual genotype. And, um, you know, I'll answer kind of what you're, you know, what you were saying before about looking at people's genes. Um, so there's, you know, I kind of want to distinguish that your, your base genetic code, like the, the sequence of the amino acids in your DNA that the letters, you know, you sometimes see it written out like A, G, T, like all those letters, um, that doesn't change. Uh, that's going to stay the same. And it's the expression of that, that time. But what I do with people is I look at that base code and, um, based on what that code looks like in certain places, we know that you might respond differently to certain, um, things and have actually different epigenetic changes. Like a good example is, um, there's a gene called APOE that uh, is really well studied now, and um, certain variants of it are, are predisposed to more plaque buildup and, and cardiovascular risk, um, as well as cognitive decline and uh, just general neuroinflammation. Um, but it's what they found is it really only happens when people eat a diet that's high in saturated fat, um, like saturated fat 
and low exercise is like a major trigger for that. Um, but when people uh, eat a diet that's lower in saturated fat and have those variants, the, the risk kind of normalizes. Um, and so you see, you know, the, the keto diet's gotten really popular, bulletproof, that kind of thing. Um, and for certain people that don't carry those variants and have the the kind of coded response where they're going to do well with saturated fats, I see fantastic improvements for people with with keto. Um, but then, you know, I'll, I'll get people that have been on keto and are like, this isn't really working for me. Um, and I, like, it's not helping their energy. It's not helping them, them focus mm-hmm. and clarity. Is it, that what you're finding? Yeah. In certain people, if, if they have those variants people. that, you know, are going to create more inflammation with saturated fat. So like you said, it's like, it kind of, we're kind of at a point now where I think it's time to get beyond the idea that like, oh yeah, this diet worked for my friend or my neighbor. Um, so it should work for me. It's, mm-hmm. it's really more complex than that. Yeah. Well, and I saw that in one of your videos on YouTube and I, I like that where you talk about the, the three things that kind of irritate you about the, that certain people, you know, pay for a coach and they tailor a specific diet to them. And that you bring, sounds like you're bringing it down to mo- the masses about what elite athletes or elite performers do. And, and you talked about the fact that they're going and they're getting these tests. So they know, they know what f- food to eat and what things to do to like make their energy higher and make them perform better. I, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, the, yeah, most people don't have, you know, there obviously there's a cost and there's an, you know, involvement to that. A lot of people are so busy just scrambling around trying to keep up that they don't take the time to like know themselves. I think that's awesome. Yeah. I think it's one of the best investments you can make. I mean, in terms of you're looking at, um, you know, as a creative or entrepreneur, or, you know, someone that's invested in, um, you know, your, your time, it's like that give, giving yourself the opportunity to really have the cognitive function and energy like ongoing, you know, is such a valuable investment. So. Absolutely. Talk, talk about the costs. What are what, like, what does it t- cost to get these, to get your genes like identified or go through this process? And what is that process? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, the cost ranges uh, for my clients and, and what we're seeing right now is there's a lot of tests on the market that are, um, inexpensive, but don't really necessarily give you the full package. Um, what we're seeing is that, um, it really requires working with someone who knows what these genes are doing to help you kind of implement it. It's kind of like you can buy direct tests that will give you readouts, but it's kind of like going and trying to interpret blood tests on your own. It's really helpful to have someone. So, um, you know, I think the coaching model makes it more, uh, effective than trying to interpret the stuff yourself. Like I just know that based on what I see in in the direct to consumer market, like I if I didn't know it, I know I'd be so confused with a lot of the stuff. Um, yeah. So, you know, the, the cost ranges. You know, you can get one of those tests for a couple hundred bucks. Um, my services tend to range between five hundred and a thousand, uh, but it's because I'm mm-hmm. taking you know usually three to four hours uh, to go through your genetics before I, we ever meet and look through it. And there's a lot of time spent on my end, actually, um, kind of mm-hmm. sifting through things, comparing it to your experience and, and what your goals are. Yeah. So that's the initial cost for the test and your analysis to, to move forward. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, uh, and then I do some ongoing coaching, you know, I have like six and 12 months packages and, um, mm-hmm. that's really where we take it and implement it over time. And, you know, that, that's really do, where I do see the best results. Cause I'm able to kind of help people tweak and refine the routine and continue to stay in touch and, and do some additional testing if we need to and track some things. Yeah. What is, what is the ongoing coaching look like? Are we talking weekly sessions and you, are you helping with diet and lifestyle? What is that process? Yeah. So that's usually uh, once or twice a month. Um, and that's kind of me, we check in, kind of get a download of what's happened in the last month and then look kind of at the next phase. Um, Cause you know, just to give you an example, like when I do a full genetic read for someone, I'm looking at about 80 pages of information that we go wow. over in a, in a, in a session. And so it's a lot of p- things that you could do. And so what I do is kind of help people narrow down, all right, these are the most important high impact things. Um, let's do those first. And then we'll, you know, once we kind of get those in place, we'll revisit some things and maybe add some things in. Um, so, you know, it's about kind of staying in, in a, in a sequence of, of events that make sense. And yeah, you know, well, well, and I know, you know, just from my own experience, I mean, if you, 
do everything that you're supposed to and keep up with this and that and, and diet and exercise, it can be overwhelming. You know, it's kind of like going to the gym, you know, I, I've kind of adopted the model of, you know, do core exercises, you know, squats and deadlifts and get the core build as opposed to like 20,000 different small things. Is that kind of what, what you're seeing? I and mean, can people get overwhelmed with all the information and do this, do that? Oh yeah, totally. I actually, that's a really good analogy. I mean, I'll, I admit like, you know, I'm a, I'm a health coach, but I don't do every single thing that I could possibly yeah. be doing. You know, it's, it's, yeah, it's about doing those core things and really kind of figuring out what are the basics that I need to do on a daily basis. That's going to leave me feeling good. And then, you know, kind of at, you know, I, I go through cycles where I'm like real on it for, you know, a few weeks or a month and I do some extra things and, you know, then it's, it's just life, you know? Um, but yeah. But exactly, like you said, yeah, I, I never. Things, f- it's, it's what's important. Yeah, it's it's a core, and you're right. You know, sometimes we slip, and I I never feel guilty anymore eating a cookie or some some sweets after I see the Rock posting his cheat meals, right? And so I'm like, hey, that's a, is he he giving the the okay to go for it? <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, so I I've tried to um, take that language out of what I do with people, like the cheat day thing. I just build it in. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like I I call it like yeah. selective hedonism. Like I know I want to like have something that's going to be, you know, pleasurable and, and not in line with the perfect diet. But honestly, I think the reward and just like the, not, not even the word, but just like building in that ability to like do the things that you want to do is super important. And it's about creating. The yeah. Crazy. Like a crate, fill a little craving, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. It's like building the resiliency mm-hmm. and all these other areas of your life goes so far so that you can, you can eat the cookie and, and like not, crash from it you know yeah well and and that's kind of the the approach that i've adopted i kind of look at it as a percentage you know thing like you know i just want the needle to be uh, as i want to eat as clean and as you know low sugar and like you know as a possible but if it dips a little one day it's not not too big deal as long as the overall percentage is like high as far as you know nutrient dense and good quality food oh yeah totally so i'm curious what are what are some things that you found that have worked really well for you like your core well things? i you know i i i know that you know definitely lots of fruits and vegetables um when i'm really on my game i do you know green smoothies because for, for me and like you touched on earlier you know being a creative and and you know you know, I feel we're creative beings and it's all about like maximizing our energy so we can actually do things. Right. And so I really try to, you know, go for walks in the morning, do exercise because when the energy dips, you get lethargic and you're like, I don't want to create anything. I don't want to do anything. And so for me, I look at it from an energetic standpoint and also clarity and focus, but I, I just try to eat, you know, as clean as possible, plant-based. Um, I do eat meat. Of course I've played with the plant-based diet, but you know, I like like you've mentioned, I've heard that some people don't do well on a total plant based diet. Other people thrive. So I just try to eat it, eat super clean and, and get a little exercise and do, do that kind of a thing. Just again, keeping the percentages mm-hmm. higher. You know, I switched off uh, years ago in, in my 20s. I had kind of this epiphany. I thought, you know, if I start eating really clean and healthy now, carrots and vegetables and whatnot, I won't have to start later. And so I kind of adopted this that this diet and did it, you know, went for the most part, I was off milk and dairy for many years. And then I kind of integrated back in a little bit back to the thing, you know, if I'm, if someone ma- makes a, a chocolate cake, I'm not going to, you know, not eat it. Uh, but I, I have almond milk and coconut milk and coffee and at home, but again, you know, just trying to learn from what other people have kind of their experience and reading books and stuff like that, try to integrate more, plant-based and healthy foods. And it's, it's been working out, you know, I feel good there, you know, when I'm on that game. So that's my, that kind of what I do. For sure. Yeah. You know, I, I, what about you? What's your, or go ahead. I was going to say the term plant-based is funny to me because I, when I, when I think about what that means, it's like, um, you know, a lot of people use that term to mean fully plant only. Yeah. Um, but I like, I, I think most all healthy diets should be plant-based at some mm-hmm. level, you know, like you're going to eat like at the core of most healthy diets, like lots of fruits and lots mm-hmm. of vegetables, at least lots of vegetables. Um, you know, and so I look at that as kind of a, a baseline thing, but then, uh, when you, you can get pretty granular as far as really looking at what types of, of fats, like what, you know, is olive oil or coconut oil or, uh, 
your, you know, what types of oils really work well for different people. I, I see some really positive results when, when people kind of get that piece right. Um, yeah, I've seen that too. So, so what, what about you? What do you, um, obviously you've probably analyzed your own genes. Well, what, what do you eat for your, what's your general diet kind of guidelines for yourself? Yeah. So I, I'm kind of a low carb guy. Um, I do pretty well with, um, you know, more of the higher fat, low carb kind of approach, lower protein. Uh, I do really well with high mono and saturated fat. I actually don't do too well with a ton of nuts, ton of polyunsaturated fat. That mm. was something that looking at my genetics really kind of helped me understand. Um, and it's, it's like one of those things that after I like saw that, um, and th there's a gene called APOA5 that, um, has to do with how your body transports polyunsaturated omega-6 fats around. And, you know, it's mm -hmm. going to be a, a lot of what's in nuts. And after I, um, after I, I saw that for the first time and really started experimenting with it, I realized like, oh yeah, when I eat, when I overeat nuts, like the next day I feel inflamed and puffy. Um, mm. so that's been something that I've, I've played around with. And, um, you know, I, I, I try to, you know, get at least 20, 30 minutes of exercise if I can, most days, you know, at mm -hmm. least ride my bike and, you know, I do strength training, heavy strength training about once a week. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, one of the big things for me has been late. Uh, and that's a big area that I, I think is, is kind of under appreciated right now is light exposure and really looking at, oh, I saw that in some of your videos. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so, so you, 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 so what about light exposure? Do you, what, what, what do we need to know about that? Yeah. So really trying to minimize artificial light exposure, uh, in favor of sun exposure. Um, mm -hmm. we evolved on this planet under a very tightly controlled electromagnetic environment. Um, and you know, the whole electromagnetic spectrum is, you know, the light is a chunk of that. Um, and so for, you know, up until the last hundred years, we never had any type of artificial lighting. And when you look at the spectrum balance of what's in fluorescent bulbs or led bulbs, it's very, very different than what's in, what's, uh, in sunlight, even the like full spectrum sun bulbs. Um, mm -hmm. you know, it's very weighted towards the blue end of the spectrum and when you look at the research that's that's been coming out and I mean, there, there's an explosion of this right now in the in the scientific community of, of looking at the effect of different frequencies of light on the human system um blue light is pretty detrimental when you're getting way too much of it especially on sleep especially on um things that can influence mood and um depression and anxiety a lot of what we're seeing you know kind of in in culture right now i mean um suicide rate is up tremendously. And one of the biggest impactors mm -hmm. of suicide is, is, is poor sleep. Like actually, when you look at some of the military studies on, on what put people at high suicide risk, like, um, lack of sleep is one of the, is the top thing. Um, and so I think we're, we're kind of in a middle of like a, a sleep epidemic, um, mm -hmm. in, in society right now. That's that at some level is being caused by just extreme overexposure to blue light. That's like, you know, computer screens, iPhone screens, everything like that. Um, part mm -hmm. of what that does is it, it suppresses melatonin. Um, and melatonin is going to be one of the most you know, important hormones to help you go to sleep. And so what ends up happening, if you're looking at a, a screen right up until you go to bed, um, your melatonin synthesis doesn't really start for another couple hours. So you're losing like a couple hours of quality sleep, even though you might be going to sleep and getting eight hours, you're only you know, maybe mm -hmm. only six or so of that five or six of that is going to have the proper amount of melatonin involved with it. So I'm a, I'm a real big proponent of, um, just light hygiene in general. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I saw you wearing the the the, the orange glasses, mm -hmm. or, or the yellow lens. Is it? Yeah, mm -hmm. the, the the blue light blocking. Yeah, right? blue light blocking lenses. I think it's really important, and I think it's one of those things when we look back um, at this point in history, and I, I hope you know, in fifty years, we're going to look and go, "Wow, we were making a big mistake." We're going to look at it. I think we're going to look back mm -hmm. at it in retrospect, like lead paint or uh, tobacco, yeah. that kind of thing. That's the thing, you know, all, even though technology is awesome and it has allowed us to, you know, do a lot of things, sometimes we create stuff that ends up being harmful on some level. And then years down the road, we're like, oh, but, but again, you know, prog along with progress comes a lot of 
things that you, you don't know until you know, right? Like I said, could be in years, years from now, people would be like, oh, that was, this created a, a big, like, uh, what do we call it? Like a, a byproduct that was not neg- that was not positive, right? Oh yeah, <laughs> totally. And it's like, we're still using paint. We just switched out the lead. <laughs> yeah. Refine, yeah. F- f- fix those things. Um, yeah. That's one of the things I did. Uh, well, it's been a couple of years now is picked up a pair of, uh, gl- you know, the blue light blocking glasses, you know, so when I'm at night in the evening, I put those things on and, um, you know, hopefully it's helping, helping in some degree. Yeah. How, how much did, did, so it's just a couple hours. Is that how long it can take? Like, say you're working into the evening. Um, do you just wear yours in the evening? You're not wearing them all day sort of a thing. Yeah. You know, I, I, I've got like the heavy, the heavy blue blocking ones, like the red lenses, uh, orange lenses. I'll wear them at night. Um, my glasses that I'm wearing right now have a, have a little bit of a blue blocking tint and I'll wear them when I'm doing computer work. Um, mm-hmm. and I actually try not to wear them if I'm going to be outside just in sunlight. Cause, um, sure. you know, there's, there's some natural blue light that's, that's good for you. You want that from the sun, but it's, it's not the balance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so you, so we just kind of integrate them in and in the evening, it sounds mm-hmm. like integrate them in, in the evening. And I, and I try and, um, you know, have some bulbs that are low blue light at night, like, um, the more traditional yeah. incandescents are a little bit better balance. Mm hmm. Yeah. D- tell me, tell me about the Epirian Center. Is that the company you're, you're associated with? What is that? Yeah. Apiron. Um, it means, it means limitless in Greek. So that's where that word comes from. Um, so they are a, uh, peak performance and optimal health related company and they, uh, they offer coaching trainings, um, as well as kind of high end one-on-one work, um, with some of the physicians there. So I've been involved with them for about three or four years. Um, mm-hmm. I initially got linked up with them uh, because my, my background is in music. Actually, I'm a, originally an audio engineer. And I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. So my uh, I, I um, was hired by them initially to create some uh, meditation and binaural beats and kind of brainwave entrainment audio programs mm-hmm. uh, for them. Um, and it's a funny story how I actually met them. I was um, at a point in my life where I had kind of just figured out a bunch of my own health problems. I um, kind of got really into the biohacking world and I was working on my own stuff, just listening to a ton of podcasts, doing my own research. Um, and the doctor who owns that uh, company had a podcast. Uh, it was called Biohacking for Optimal Health. And it was one of my favorite podcasts. And I uh, took a walk on my lunch break at work and realized that the logo of the podcast was on the building next door. And oh, you're kidding. <laughs> yeah. So it turned out they had a clinic next to where I was working. And so I, I made an appointment to go see him because I wanted to get some blood work done. And it just kind of turned into this thing where they were looking for someone who was an audio engineer and kind of had like a health background too. Um, That's so, awesome. Yeah. So I, it, one of those life changing synchronicity kind of things. Um, yeah. So, so tell me, tell me about some of the th- things that you, uh, were able to kind of dial into and tweak in your own health journey. Yeah. So, you know, one of the big things for me was circadian rhythm. Um, my, like I, you know, I mentioned like my, my background was in music. I, um, create electronic music. I still, uh, do that release music and, and play gigs here and there. Um, but that was my main thing for a while and being in, you know, an environment where I was just staying up till, you know, three or four in the morning to play gigs all the time and working on music at odd hours and flipping my schedule back and forth kind of wreaked havoc. And I think that was at the core of a lot of some of the stuff that was going on, but you know, I also wasn't paying any attention to what I was eating. I was um, kind of like an unhealthy vegetarian, like a bread, a cheese, a Uh, Mm -hmm. and you know, I I think the, the circadian rhythm thing kind of just like exacerbated everything else. And so, you know, I, I got back on a normal sleep rhythm, really dialed in the, you know, it was a plant-based diet that closer to a keto kind of plant-based kind of approach, um, started taking some supplements and things that, um, you know, I just never touched before. I, I didn't know this stuff existed. And I think that's one of the reasons why I'm so like interested in this work and talking to people like yourself and, and talking to other creatives is that, um, you know, this stuff is pretty popular in like the sports performance world and in certain circles of like, you know, kind of high performance, uh, business CEO kind of stuff, but it doesn't really get 
talked about outside, um, you know, especially in the more like artistic creative circles, like there's, there's not much, uh, focus on, on, you know, how you're treating your body translating into, into better, you know, uh, productivity and focus and that kind of thing. So, um, I saw such a, just a major transformation in myself and like on a, on a psychological side of things too, like it was like all of a sudden I had the mental energy to process emotional stuff that I hadn't dealt with, you know, and, and really you know, got myself in a place where I could do the, the self-development work. Um, and so, you know, I think that's a big piece of it too, is like kind of taking the, the, the energy and the better brain function and saying, all right, how can I look at my, uh, my patterns and my life and really kind of work on the, the emotional psychological side of it at the same time. Cause I think that just reinforces it. Yeah. Well, in, 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 you know, it's fascinating. One of the things that came up, came to mind as you were talking, I think, and this is definitely from my own experience. Sometimes we, you know, our, either our energy level goes down or our clarity level goes down and we just kind of like frog and hot water kind of a thing. We don't know mm-hmm. how bad it is until we, start to tune it back up and we just think, oh, well, I need to drink eight cups of coffee today or I need to drink Red Bull all day to stay energized. And until we start tweaking with it and kind of optimizing our diet and what we're thinking and exercise to get that, those energy and clarity up, we don't know how good it can get. It can, it's like a slow, it's like a steady slope down a slippery slope and you slide into this doldrum life and then it's just like autopilot at a low level, right? Oh, I couldn't have said it better. Yeah. You you just don't know what you don't know. Um, yeah, you don't know how good you can feel. And then, and that's what I think is fascinating about life is that sometimes you think, well, it's, it's just like this, like I'm, my energy levels like this and and my diet, this diet, and what else can I do? Right. You just go for it. But what I'm fascinated about is, okay, when you get some information and try some tweaks and changes and start eating, you know, good food and getting exercises and stuff like that you can actually feel better and create better and stuff like that. Oh yeah, absolutely. And it, it really comes down to that growth first fixed mindset type awareness. Yeah. Um, are you someone that believes that you're capable of change or this is just how I am? And that translates from the health aspect of things into so many areas of, of life. I mean, when you look at research with centenarians, you know, people that are over a hundred, it's that fixed mind or that fixed adverse growth mindset where they're looking at all these different situations in their life over time as opportunities for growth, that that's one of the big things that kind of sets those people apart that, um, creates the conditions to where their body is, is going to last a really long time. It's just that mental, um, perspective is so important. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Yeah, I love that growth versus fixed mindset. You know, in my own experience, whether you know venturing into online business and and learning, you know, prosperity and abundance, and that it, you know you can have a better life than say what you were programmed from, you know, during your tra- formative years, childhood, whatnot. It's fascinating that, that that we have that that we have that power and that ability to do that. That more people, I think more people are waking up to that all the time. Yeah, absolutely. And it's also really interesting on that note um, to kind of think about what your, your programming was growing up around health and nutrition and like what messages you got about that. You know, it, it was food something that you were told can impact the way you feel. Or was it just something that you did that didn't have any connection to that? I mean, that's something that I had to kind of um, retrain myself, you know, like mm-hmm, me too. Yeah. yeah. Cause, you, Cause you, you know, we, we, whatever, you know, generation you come from, you know, the Mac and cheese generation, right. Or the wonder, wonder bread, white bread, you know, I mean, if that's what you know, that's what you know. But until you get a broader perspective and start uh, peeling back the layers and saying, Hey, you know, what's possible here? What should I, what should I be eating? What do, like you said, you know, what do people who operate at a high level. I, I think of uh, Tom Brady. I like I say, what are these optimal athletes and these, you know, CEOs and business people, you know, in, in addition to their meditation practices, what are they eating? What are they thinking? What are they consuming? Because th- those are the high performers, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And it, it's, and, you know, it's not necessarily about copying those people directly. It's like, right, you know, yeah. I think about it a lot. Like if you're an artist, uh, say you're a painter and you're developing, you know, your own style, like you kind of have to start with copying the masters, right? Like you, mm-hmm. you, you do some things mm-hmm. that have been passed down and, and you get the technique right. 
But then over mm-hmm. time, you kind of take all those elements and sort of recontextualize them and make them your own thing. And I look at the the process of creating health in a really similar way where, you know, th- yeah, there's some important techniques to learn, but the, your, the way you combine those techniques is not going to be necessarily exactly like someone else. Yeah, good point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're right. Because like you said, they've, they've identified their specific you know, gene type and body style, probably right. And what works for them. And we, it sounds like we need to all do that on, on our own individual level. Yeah, totally. And, and it's like, you know, a lot of those people, um, you know, not have not necessarily looked at their genes, but they've done enough experimentation to where they've kind of dialed mm. in and gotten it right. And, um, you know, when I work with certain people that are already high performers and have figured out a lot of the stuff, sometimes the mm-hmm. genes will confirm a lot of what they already know. Um, mm, and they've so, already tested trial and tested the, and kind of gotten that in, information via via trial and error kind of a thing. Right. Exactly. Like, yeah, I already knew that, uh, you know, I don't do well with dairy, but here's some actual reasons why. Like here, here's some genes that are, are likely to not process dairy in a certain or make your body process dairy poorly, you know. Um, so it's really helpful in connecting the dots. And there's al- almost always things that you know, also you just couldn't have known through experimentation. There's, there's some things you can find out, but then some things with the genetics, it's like a whole new right. world of understanding there too. It's like, you know, c- comes back to the, you know, age old advice, you know, no- knowledge is power. And then once you know, you can make changes in your like day-to-day activities and what you're eating that can, you know, p- apply that knowledge. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, the, the information is everything. And I, I think there's also, um, you know, kind of the choice with that, I think, you know, people can make to be empowered by it rather than kind of be afraid of information. It's like, there's some people out there with genetic testing where they say, well, I'd rather not know these things because then I'm more, mm-hmm. um, I'm almost more responsible for, for having, right. I'm going to focus it into being right. I'm going to, I'm going to, is that, is that, that's, I, I've seen people like that and I can understand that. So what's your thoughts on that? Uh, say that last part again. Uh, what's your thoughts on the people that are, you know, I don't want to know. I just want to live in, in ignorance and bliss kind of a thing. Oh, you know, that's their choice. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that's indicative of the fixed kind of mindset of, you know, I'd rather not have the information that's going to let me uh, change. Or maybe it's people that, you know, aren't really seeing themselves as capable of change or don't want it. You know, people get comfortable. You know, there's mm-hmm. there's the most comfortable thing you can do is to do the same thing you've always done. Um, the question that you have to ask yourself is 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 are, are you happy with the results you're getting? You know, so it's like yeah. Um, but I think a lot of times people are more, um, you know, not a lot of the people that I work with, but at large are more comfortable just you know not knowing. But mm-hmm. I, I, I don't know, part of these conversations and um, what I'm trying to do is help people understand that it's worth it. You know, it's worth it to um, really take the the dive into what's possible for you when you do have that information and, and when you do start Absolutely. making little changes, you know? Yeah. You know, this theme of uh, uncomfortableness, I always it's kind of describe myself in, sometimes as a, a comfortaholic, right? Uh, <laughs> living many years of my life kind of on autopilot, you know, working, having fun, but really not pushing the boundaries of what's possible. But eventually, I think, you know, sometimes it may never activate in people if they have, like you said, if they're getting the results they want, if they're happy, if they're happy with their life. But I think the nature of human beings is like expansion and growth. And we we came here to kind of push into those boundaries. And, you know, that's why I say, you know, I, I always have like to think about this like an alcoholic does they're always kind of have that tendency to slide back into comfort but we know that life gets much more full and rich and and much better when we're pushing you know pushing our potential and doing things that are really like stretching us you know oh yeah absolutely i mean i think that the anxiety and the fear of what people perceive as the potential suffering that's going to come from putting yourself out of your comfort zone is the actual reality of that is almost inherently every single time less than the suffering that you're happening with that, that's going on now. <laughs> totally. Change, right. Like the, the discomfort of lifting the heavy thing 10 times is way worse than, you know, um, feeling like your back hurts because you don't have that strength. Right? Yeah. Or I'm sorry. It, the, the, the back hurting is way worse than putting the effort in. You know? 
Right. For, for, from lack of use and lethargy, or then you'd move one weekend and you, you heard it right. As opposed to lifting that weight over, you know, periods of time and strengthening it. I agree. Yeah. And it's kind of like, um, you know, once you get a taste of that, I mean, I'll speak from my experience. Once I got a taste of that, um, it made me start to realize, oh, this applies in other areas of life. And it comes back to what I was saying with like some of the psychological work of like being willing to look at painful, shameful things, you know, that are no longer painful or shameful, but at the time were, you know, and it's like mm-hmm. doing that work of really yeah, yeah, yeah. sitting through that and, and addressing and acknowledging it. Yeah. That sucked in the moment, but um, it's way better now because I took that little bit of, of risk and, and, and chance and, um, I love that word though, the comfort holic thing. I mean, that, you know. yeah, it just, it just, you know, cause I mean, who, who doesn't want to, you know, be wrap themselves in a blanket and lay on the couch uh-huh. all day, you know, that's, there's some level of like bliss to that, but over time, you know, but what do you, what are the opportunity costs that you're missing out on? You know, cause I think it's like coded into us to freaking push into the universe and do things. Um, it's just fascinating. Yeah. I mean, I, it's, I love curling up in a blanket and watching Netflix yeah. and you know, it, it's, it, it's just imbalance, I suppose with, um, yeah. Things. Well, in, in the, you know, the thing of it is, you know, we, we, back to your, uh, talking about uh doing the strength training and you know pushing into what whether we're looking at emotional issues and healing those or strengthening our resilience w- one of the things that i've experienced in my own life and i see this in other people is it's counterintuitive but the safest place for us is in the eye of the storm so to speak you know maybe getting proper exercise on a consistent basis doing hard things on a consistent basis and this was very counterintuitive to me you know you think okay well i just want to have a safe comfortable you know middle class life but you realize that especially after the you know 2008 crash that the that the safest place may in fact be what you perceive as the most risky right in the eye of the storm kind of a thing whether it's physically mentally you know economically that's one of the things that I'm finding emerging um, in many people and definitely myself too. Yeah. What are, what are some things that you've done that kind of, um, you know, kind of have pushed you into that, that eye of the storm, so to speak? Well, you know, really just tuning in to the, to the little voice within and the guidance that is within us. And, you know, in 2000, what am I like seven, five, five to seven years in launching online business after seeing a number of people that I follow have success taking their passion and building it into a, a business. Um, and then just venturing out there, putting yourself out there because, you know, as a comfortaholic, as a former people pleaser, again, I, I'm a people, people pleaser, a as well. And so that doesn't really help you when you're trying to create stuff because you're always wondering how is this going to be received? Are people going to judge this kind of thing? But again, back to the eye of the storm kind of a thing in my own experience, it's like, you got to go for it because sitting on the shore waiting for, you know, or trying to hunker down, letting the storm pass, you just get beat up too much and you don't move forward, you know? And so that's when one thing is just like creating and it's still challenging, you know, whether it's a video or a podcast or a piece of content and I'm still, I, I also call it like baby steps, you know, I'm baby stepping my way to my end destination. And so it's just, you know, doing what wants to come through me and letting it, you know, go through and embracing that fear and just saying, hey, you know, this is, this is how it is. And, and, you know, David, the only thing or one of the major driving forces is I know what's back there waiting for me if I don't do it. And so I look at it as like a, I have this model of, you know, moving forward and actually taking action. I call it a polarity tool. And, you know, on one side of it, you've got what you don't want, the the life that you had or the life that you could have if you don't take the action or create the thing or, you know, be valuable to, to the world. And on the other side, you have what what can potentially be for you, what's waiting for you, the lifestyle, the the business opportunities, the connections. And once you put those two together, it, it moves you on a daily basis. So if you look at those lists of things that you build, so that's that's a major tool that moves me. What's waiting for me and what was well, you know, what would be waiting for me if I don't Oh do yeah. It. That's that's great. Like the synergy of both that push and pull, like at the same time. Absolutely. Is really strong. Absolutely. You know, because uh, you know, I've, in my experience what you know we we're we'd rather move towards or we have a much more aversion to pain you know we want to move away from pain 
as opposed to sometimes, you know, what, what's waiting for us was be like, oh, you know, back to the comfort thing. You know, I'm comfortable in this water that's X number of degrees, you know, even though it's not ideal, you know, those the temperatures turn up. I think that's one of the reasons why humans, uh, you know, crash and burn is because they're not doing enough. They're not creating enough. They're not pushing into those uh, unknowns in those scary situations. And again, speaking from my own experience, but what you see from what I see from high performers and people that are having the success, a lot of success, they are every day constantly pushing themselves to do more and to create more and to be more valuable and just to get out of your comfort zone. Yeah, absolutely. And I, th- it sounds like you've well, I've, I've tried and I continue to try and, you know, it's a daily, it's a daily yeah, process. It is. Isn't it, it? It's, it's exactly like you said, it's easy to slip back into it. And I think that there's, um, you know, the need for kind of constant self assessment, self awareness and, and not getting comfortable because there's, you know, it's, it's kind of an ever increasing threshold of, of what is that risk? What is that next step? Uh, cause what was risky, you know, a few years ago might not be now. Um, yeah, good point. Yeah. It's and at the same thing. time, it's like, you know, I think there's a myth of perpetual growth and, per- and perpetual progress, uh, in all areas, you know, but it's more about selectively choosing like, all right, where do I want to see change and where, where am I curious about that? I mean, for me, it's really the curiosity kind of leads me there. You know, it's, it's almost more of a, of just a, a an engagement with the unknown that's, that's really exciting it, it's like um trying to just leverage that and and stay in touch with that i feel like is, is really helpful in that process at least for me and um yeah no, i get yeah that. And, and just mm-hmm. you know letting that sense of curiosity kind of guide where i'm putting my energy um tends to at least so far have yielded the best results yeah no i totally get that you you mentioned uh by neuro beats and biohacking. What's the? It sounds like you have some experience being a music creator and whatnot. What What do we need to know about by neuro beats? What do they What do they do? And are they Are they beneficial? How are they beneficial to us? Yeah. So I think they can be beneficial. Um, what they do is help attune the brain uh, to certain brainwave states. Um, so you know, when you're going through your day, you're going to sleep, your brain is in predominantly different brainwave states. So when we're awake, we're paying attention to things. We're mostly producing beta brainwaves, which fire at about 12 to 20 times per second. When we're going to sleep, um, you kind of start out in that like 10, your brain waves get slower as you go to sleep. And so like meditation is associated with uh, theta and and alpha brainwaves, um, kind of in the seven to 12 or 11 Hertz, uh, times per second. And so what, what, uh, binaural beats and other forms of brainwave entrainment can do and, and binaural beats aren't the only type. It's a specific, um, kind of technology, but they can help the brain, uh, move into those states with a little bit more fluidity and ease. And so they can be very helpful for doing things like assisting in meditation, assisting in going to sleep, assisting in focus, um, and they're they're you know very helpful for developing that neuroplasticity um, and really kind of giving your yourself some just assistance really in in changing your brainwave state. So I found it personally very helpful for learning how to meditate and really kind of prompting my brain to get into that state. And uh, I actually do have a company called Inner Depth Audio. Um, you can check out the um, websites, innerdepthaudio.com. And I make some brainwave entrainment programs and I've got like a free five minute um, sample you can download. Um, but I've got things that help people with um, you know focus, kind of relaxation and meditation, sleep. Um, and then I've got some other just kind of experimental, interesting stuff up there that I've made that you know you can take for a spin and see what happens. Sure. Well, when, when do you use the binaural beats? Is there a certain time of day or is any time fair game to put the headphones on and, and go for it? Yeah. So it kind of depends on what your purpose is. Um, uh, you know, any time would be okay. You just kind of want to make sure you're using the right frequency and the right type. Um, mm-hmm. So I'll use them most often for getting work done, for, for kind of putting my brain in a focused state. And I like the um, 14 hertz range for that it's kind of the low beta um high beta is more associated with like 
anxiety, agitation, like a little too much uh, energy going on there. The low beta is more associated mm-hmm. with like relaxed focus. So I find it pretty helpful for kind of zoning into some work and and just kind of blasting through, um, you know, writing or uh, putting together an outline or, or anything like that. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, awesome. Um, wh- what about supplements and vitamins and stuff? What's your take on that for for people? Again, it probably comes back to an individual basis, but are there any any overall guidelines or information we we need to know? Yeah, so um, I'm a, I'm a fan. I think that um, with our current state of food and agriculture, there's a lot of mineral depletion in the soil. Um, so even if you are eating a you know plant based really healthy diet, there still could be gaps. Um, and you know, while it's unfortunate, like 90% of the U.S. soil is depleted of magnesium. So there's a pretty broad magnesium mm-hmm. deficiency going on right now. Um, and, you know, there's some there's some kind of general things. Like I think most people probably could use some magnesium, but then it does get very specific. And that's a lot of the work that I do with clients is really looking at what pathways in the body are going to require more nutrients. You know, what things are going to take, um, say vitamin B12 or folate or B6 and kind of use more of them for certain people. Um, just because there's, there's certain biochemical processes that require these nutrients. And with the genetics, you can really look and see, all right, in this step of that sequence, the the synthesis sequence, um, you know, uh, are you going to be someone who requires more of this nutrient? And so based on that, you can kind of get a feel for, all right, I should either supplement or focus on these specific foods. And I think there's a lot of benefits to uh, a number of different herbs for certain things and um, phytochemicals. And, um, you know, there's all kinds of different classes of things that I think are very helpful for uh, cognition and Mm -hmm. healthy aging and all that. Um, but it it does tend to be pretty individual. Um, you know, there's some things that I think most people could do well with, but at the same time, I hesitate to, to mention anything because yeah, Yeah, make a blanket. Yeah. I, I get that. You know, I, I, I've heard that too, is, you know, the way I kind of have looked at vitamins and minerals is it's kind of like a, a little bit of an insurance policy to make sure you're, like you said, you're getting those nutrients that may may or may not be in the foods that you're eating. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm okay with having, um, expensive mm-hmm. pee if I, if I pee it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. If it's going to help you like get those energy levels up or the clarity or get, you know, improve in some, some way, get that, get that, get that needle to optimized energy. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I really look at, um, kind of the potential of, people's health as kind of existing in, you know, kind of multiple phases where, um, you know, there's kind of the unbalanced to balance phase. And that's really where kind of mainstream medicine stops. You know, they say like, all right, you know, if you don't have a disease, like you're good, right? Like that's kind of where Mm -hmm. it stops. Um, But then there's also kind of the, the, the balanced to optimized and enhanced kind of phases where you're really looking at, you know, using a lot of the same techniques and technologies and and supplements, but looking at, all right, what's possible, what's the next step. Um, And so, you know, I I really like working on that kind of thing with clients in in terms of using nootropics and and things that improve cognition and really can help kind of, you know, take you from where you're at, no matter where you're at and kind of move you up the ladder there, so to speak. Yeah, that's totally awesome. Well, this has been awesome chatting with you, David. It's this is really fascinating. Yeah, it's been a pleasure too. Really appreciate your perspective, and um, you know, love some of the stuff you were saying about the um, comfort zones and all that. It's super important and just applicable it is, everywhere. Yeah. I, I I feel so. Yeah. But before we wrap up, tell people how they can get in touch with you. A website, social media. Where where can we find out more and follow you and contact you? Yeah, absolutely. So my website is david krantzcom K R A N T Z, and you can look around, look at some of my offerings, uh, read a little bit more about what I do. I've got some articles up there, uh, and I also offer free thirty minute consultations for anyone who's interested and thinks this might be of benefit. Um, kind of talk about what your goals are, what yeah, uh, what your needs are and see if we're a good fit to work together. Um, so you can book an appointment online there. Um, and I'm also on Instagram, uh, and the handle, uh, whole systems health. And I put a lot of, um, food and nutrition stuff up there. Awesome. So people can contact you right through your website then. Mm-hmm. Yep. Awesome. And I'll put those links in the show notes 
beneath this episode at gmarkphillips.com so people can find them. Um, David, I appreciate it again. This has been super awesome. Yeah, it's been super awesome too. I mean, you know, if, if there's one takeaway, I, I'd say that, um, you know, we're kind of entering a, a phase of understanding where we're moving away from the one size fits all thing. You know, the, the food pyramid is kind of a failed experiment. Um, so the question is, you know, what's next? And I, I think the new the new way is really to look at all of these individual kind of variations and predispositions and, and really think about yourself as your own experiment. Yeah, that's a great, a great point. Absolutely. Well, awesome. All right. Well, thanks again, David. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Great talking with you, Mark. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that conversation and came away with some, some practical nuggets that you can apply in your life. I know that I did. And again, if you want to learn more about David and his work, I will have links in the show notes beneath this episode at gmarkphillips.com. You can always go there and find the resources we talked about, the links, uh, some of the nuggets information that I've pulled from the conversation if you don't have time to listen to the whole episode. But I want to thank you for tuning in. I really do appreciate it. And until next time, all the best, health, wealth, and success. Bye-bye.